Okay. Hi, welcome to the latest episode of the Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast, where we celebrate the works of the greatest storyteller of the 20th century. My name is Tim DeForest. I am the author of several books on uh, on pre-digital pop culture, such as the pulp magazines that Edgar Rice Burroughs was uh, was published in. And I'm joined by my two um, uh, uh, co-hosts tonight. Oh, my name is Jess Terrell, struggling with technology tonight. Uh, we're back here in the hills where we have to pipe sunshine in every day. And apparently the lack of sunshine is affecting my, the, the ability for my equipment to work. But otherwise, we persevere. We shall press on. Oh, by the way, you'll find me when technology is working. You'll find me over at the Facebook group for the love of all things Edgar Rice Bros. And glad to have you all join us tonight. I'm Scott Stewart. I'm glad to be here. Freelance uh, writer and editor. Um, in the process of moving from the uh, cold, deep snows of Minnesota to uh, Denver, Colorado here anytime. Our house is up for sale. We got lots of people coming through it. So uh, <laughs> a lot of my books and references and including my notes from last time are packed someplace. <laughs> anyway, um, in packing, it remind me of a couple of things. Tim, I have three of your books. Uh, the oh. double features, the uh, um, double feature one, the one on uh, movies for families or under mm-hmm. movies or however that was. And of course, the uh, storytelling on pulp and radio. And I, I just wanted, when I picked them up, I was looking through them again, as books are meant to be done. <laughs> and uh, they're really good books. So I wanted to uh, give you a little promo here and tell any of the listeners out there. Well, it's a good, good, good part of your reading time to, to take those out. You won't feel like you're wasting money or time. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then, really, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just always good to hear compliments on my books. And uh, also for uh, just running uh, for all, for the love of all things, Edgar Rice Burroughs, he posts and a lot of times I'll post along with other things on uh, uh, uh uh, street corner sideshow and curiosity shop a face page I have right like people to post events that are coming up and books or records or comics whatever they're selling there and uh early June in case we forget at, to mention at the end of the uh podcast here uh June 2nd 3rd and 4th I believe down in San Antonio will be the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs Dum Dum convention that's uh, right uh, so if people want to go out to the official Edgar Rice Burroughs sites or, or um, uh, just a site for Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs or a street corner sideshow and curiosity shop, you can find links. I'll give you more information from that. I think I expect to be there this year and it's been a couple of years since I've been to one. I'm really looking forward to it. And, and since uh, I'll be on a route, I'm thinking of taking a drive from Denver to San Antonio go through cross planes and do a little Robert E. Howard uh, research there. So That would be cool too. Yeah. Well, I think, it, well, I did have a, a route planned. Now I'll put this out there in case anybody else was going to be out <laughs> down to, down to uh, uh, Dodge city and the, for the old West and Robert E. Howard, San Antonio, come back through Carlsbad, Roswell, the media crater, um, fetch pride forest back up to Denver. But, when I calculated my gasoline costs, it's ten thousand dollars. So I probably just do a hundred dollar flight. <laughs> well, while you're at Roswell, grab one of those flying saucers. Those things travel pretty cheap, I'm told. Well, I was going to take a flying saucer into Roswell, hopefully not crash, and then take the stage course and uh, horses over to Arizona where Geronimo surrendered, and then Tombstone, and have a talk with some people at OK Crowd. That'll work. That would be a cool trip. I have been to Roswell, by the way. It's a, it's a neat place to spend an afternoon. So Okay. Well, and I just appreciate you guys being here. We have had technical difficulties in just connecting tonight. And uh, um, tell you, we, we, we're not able to produce episodes often enough, I think, to justify a Patreon page. But uh, tonight, I think we would all deserve all, uh, Patreon supporters to give us a, like a million dollars each. Because we really <laughs> endured to get to this recording session. Well, piping that sunshine back here in the hills is kind of a chore. So that, that, <laughs> might, that might sound like a good idea. Yeah. Oh, before we get started, I'm sorry. Just Scott, you mentioned Robert E. Howard going through cross planes, which I think would be a cool place to stop. Oh, I've, I've wanted to do that I, for years. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge Howard fan as well. And it just occurred to me if somebody writing a fan fiction could figure out a way to get um, 
Tarzan into Afghanistan in the 1920s and him teaming up with Howard's heroes, El Borak, you know, Francis Xavier Ooh. Gordon would be like awesome. Somebody needs to fan fiction that. That so, would be totally cool. Yeah. So, or uh, have El Borak visiting Africa for some reason. So either might work. Well, and considering so, with uh, the longevity mm -hmm. uh, uh, medicine, who knows, <laughs> he could... Uh, be fighting with Conan himself. You see those little comic stories. Who's yeah, going to that's Conan true. Or, Tarzan. Mm -hmm. or Cole, King Cole. Yeah. <laughs> so, Solomon Kane. <laughs> okay. Um, and. <laughs> I believe I hear the tribe of Kershak in the background. He's reminding us that we need to get started and talk about our my first ERB segment. And the last episode, we talked about a poll posted on the For, uh, the For Love of uh, All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs site uh, about how old people were when they first, um, when they first encountered, with, read their first Burroughs book. And most of them, I think, were under 12. Almost all fans came to him as a child and just kept that love of, adve as, of adventure as they, were, uh, as they hit adulthood. Um, and following that up, I posted my own poll asking people uh, what, what series their first era ER book uh, was. I didn't want to ask specifically what book because we would have a poll a million miles long, but um, we had 151 people respond to that poll. Um, 78 of them, which is like something like 51%, uh, their first Burroughs book was part of the Tarzan series. 51 of them, which is about a third, was uh, was the John Carter of Mars series. Um, we had 15 people came to Burroughs through Pellucidor, four with Caspak, two with Venus, and two with non-series books. Um, the other choices on the pool, the poll were the Mucker books and the Moon books, but nobody nobody clicked off on them as their first Burroughs books. Um, although they would have still had some good adventures there. So. <laughs> Not surprisingly, because Tarzan's the character who's well known in, in popular culture. Um, uh, most people come to Tarzan through Burroughs through the Tarzan books. I think we all did, right? Mine, my first was uh, uh, Tarzan of the Apes. Scott, yours was Return of Tarzan, right? Yeah, it absolutely was. Love Return yeah. of Tarzan. Yeah, and Jess, remind us what your first Burroughs book Return was. of Tarzan, I love it as well. Okay, um, so... So we're in that Tarzan group. All of us came to him through that character. Um, and it's really not surprising. The average non burroughs person, um, especially since the John Carter movie didn't, uh, wasn't that successful, they, they don't know the other characters as well. So it's, it's not surprising to me that most people are drawn to Tarzan first. A lot of them were, had probably seen a movie or the cartoon or the Ronnie Lee TV show or whatever, and that would have drawn them to the books. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything like particularly intellectual or brilliant to say about it. It's just uh, Tarzan is the entry <laughs> book through the major for the majority of people who become fans of Burroughs of Burroughs' work. So, and with John Carter being a close second, um, I wonder if the additions with Michael Whelan's covers that came out starting what in the seventies might have drawn a lot of people to it because those were awesome covers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree with that, but I would also have to put in a plug for um, Crinkle and most definitely for Zeta. And yeah. There, there's been other artists too. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesco did some covers there in the uh, mid nineties or thereabouts memory serves. Uh, those were the two first. That is where he had two, two stories in one book. Mm -hmm. He did some of those covers. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I, my opinion, and I don't understand, this is a whole different topic. I don't understand the modern day thinking about some kind of an abstract, non-related cover uh, for a book. <laughs> but my opinion, those artists, be it Michael Whalen or uh, or, or Frazetta or, or Crinkle or, who, or whomever, uh, J, J, J. Allen St. John for that matter, um, fine artwork has helped. It's an attention getter for mm -hmm. these stories. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it also provides the mind's eye image of mm -hmm. what the character may look like to some yeah. degree and you can visualize that character i certainly do when reading the adventure 
Mm -hmm. So I think effective cover art is essential. If you can squeeze a few interior pictures in there, that's, that's even more the merrier. Yeah. And this, this also is my opinion. I think um, because books are not the impulse buys they used to be because of the price. Um, you know, if I saw a book on a Eckert drugs rack and it was, you know, I could probably dig up the 95 cents to buy it. But um, nowadays uh, even paperbacks run $10 or more. So yeah. they're not impulse buys. So I believe that publishers do not think cover art is, is, is as important as it was because you're not going to make it stand out on the bookshelf and grab uh, a reader for an impulse buy anymore. They're just, they just cost too much money individually. Um, that, once again, is just an, I have no science to back that up. That's just an opinion. I think well, the I, same, I, same thing is oh, true in the comic book industry. Comic book covers, I think, are less interesting than they used to be because comic books are now expensive enough to where they're not impulse buys. But isn't there more, and again, this is a whole nother discussion, but yeah. isn't there more emphasis on comic book covers and the alternates and sometimes at the sacrifice of a good story in general I, terms? Yeah, I'm I think that could be very true. Yeah, I think I think that's less of a problem than it was in the 90s when the, well, collector, bubble, the collector bubble burst. They were doing like seven alternate covers of, of magazines and expecting collectors to buy all of them. And when they realized that, you know, it's, they're not ever going to be rare. They're not ever going to be worth anything because nobody's mom is throwing out their comic book collection anymore. There's still going to be 2 million copies of it out there. So it's never going to be valuable as a collector, uh, a collector's item. So that's the, the comic book collector bubble popped. And so I don't think you get alternate covers as often as you did. It's just not a selling point anymore. Okay. And I think the covers too now, I mean, there are some of incredible uh, mm -hmm. artists out there and stuff and work they do. But nowadays it looks, so many of the covers seem to be geared, this is my feeling, to be more like a pinup or, or a poster that could be resold. They're beautiful pieces of work, but um, as, as Tim, you were talking about the impulse pie, mm. um, they get your attention, you look at. But when, when I went in with my dime and two pennies and uh, saw Batman walking in an alien landscape, don't know how he got out of Gotham, holding a dead Robin in his arms and with a, a, a word balloon from the dialogue balloon from the story, you got no choice. You got to buy that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, go that home. And read it. That, that I got kicked out of more than one store for just staying there and reading it yeah. instead of buying it. <laughs> I, I think the best example ever of a cover, which a, a young boy would say, I have to buy that, is the George Wilson cover for uh, the comic, the Gold Key adaptation of Tarzan the Untamed, where he's holding the machine gun. Yes. Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, and the lion is next to him. Yes. You know, there's there's not an eight to twelve year old boy in the world who would see that and not desperately want to read that story, or any Turok comic. Yeah, those dinosaurs. dinosaurs yeah, when they were revamping the uh, display at the Edgar Rice Burroughs collection at the University of Louisville, mm. uh, I pointed that comic out to them. I said, make sure you hang that up because that's probably the most most sought after cover for mm. any of the Tarzan Gold Keys. And there's some fine covers there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would agree. So, um, well, anyway, that's our first ERB, um, our first ERB uh, segment for today. Um, any of you listening, if you want to drop us an email at edgarsmailbag.gmail.com uh, with like a story about your first Edgar Rice Burroughs book, we would love, and you don't mind us sharing it in a podcast interview, in, a, in this podcast segment, then please feel free to do so. Just you write it up or even record a little MP3 and attach that to the, um, to the email because we would love to hear your story of your first experience with Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, what book is it that made you a fan? So, but anyway, tonight we are getting back to the Beasts of Tarzan. Uh, in the last episode, we discussed the first five chapters before... Um, before uh, uh, we had some technical difficulties and had to end recording that episode a little bit early. Fortunately, it ended at a point where Scott had finished talking about a specific chapter. So we had a good cutoff point. Um, although, um, and so we're gonna pick up with Beasts of Tarzan right where we left off with chapter six. If you, uh, if you haven't listened to part one of the Beasts of Tarzan yet, our previous episode, I would suggest you pause this one and listen to that first. 
um, because we're going to just dive right into the story for where we're at. Um, and uh, um, uh, so that's like your best route for knowing what's going on. Or even better, pause this and reread the book and then listen to both episodes. So, so Scott, you were going to talk about chapter six. Yes, um, and that's titled A Hideous Crew. Uh, and this was a good one because just in case no one's gone back to listen or heard the other part, Tarzan is now um, on a uh, boat with uh, a uh, chief from a tribe that had, it, it was their boat and every, everyone in that tribe is gone except for the chief who, who still remained. And uh, Tarzan has worked with the uh, uh, fellow primates or apes, uh, however you wanna call them, on the island um, in a primitive form of, uh, of communication with them and training them so they can kind of learn how to <laughs> row this uh, water going vessel. So Tarzan's on there with the chief uh, and I'm gonna, I don't remember exact number, I'll say like 10 of the uh, 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 apes on there with them. And of course, um, the uh, panther, mm. or not panther, the uh, um, leopard, right? Yes, right. Uh, uh, yes, well, he's a, yeah. And there, yeah. Were, uh, there were 12, um, 12 apes. Okay, okay, yeah, T 10 after, because I'll jump ahead here. Once they get there, two of them took off because their they're lower intelligence rates are like, oh, you know, and they go off. <laughs> and that's the one thing we see when he's training him in previous chapter and that you see where how Burroughs describes the rowing of the boat is uh, he was able to communicate and work with them in a way as a team and some coordination and, and some understanding of the physical, um, not necessarily ability, but uh, uh, dexterity for rowing the boat and that type of thing. And, and it is, they're able to get across the water on that. But he talks about that in the training in chapter five, mm -hmm. where they are, um, they don't have the same intellectual as man. You know, yeah, obviously. I, I actually like that part. Burroughs, uh, we see this in other novels too, like Jewels of Opar. When he has apes as major characters, he never forgets that they're not human. And there's some stuff that they're not going to be able to do or figure out as well, because they're just not smart enough. And the whole description of, you know, Akut, the king of the tribe, is smarter than average and he gets the rowing, but the others keep having trouble with it because, <laughs> you know, and I, that, that, in addition to two of them just wandering away and saying, the heck with this rowing stuff, we're going to just go off into the jungle. Um, that's very, it's all very ape-like and it just establishes the right atmosphere for the apes. I've known a few human beings who would walk away from a job like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yeah. And, if, if you have and to I have a few teenagers like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, if your job is to be in a small boat with a man-eating leopard, then <laughs> I don't know if I can blame people for walking away from that particular job, regardless of your work ethic. Well, that, yeah. Uh, I, excuse me. I, I think I said last week, and if I didn't, it certainly bears repeating. <laughs> um, uh, Mugambi. Mm -hmm. He deserves a lot of credit for sticking mm -hmm. this thing out. Suddenly, he's lost his lost his followers, and suddenly he's he's been recruited by this this wild guy, and who's got a bunch of Mangani with him, uh, plus a leopard. And and Mugambi signs on and says, "Sure, I'll I'll help you all out." Not sure why he does that, but he does. Mm -hmm. he does. Well, I think he's afraid if he walked away, the leopard wouldn't think he's a friend anymore. Yeah. Well, that's Mugambi's character arc. At first, he helps because he's just scared, and understandably so. But he's also a courageous man, so he gets used to the animals, and he learns. He and Tarzan learn to respect each other as brave mm -hmm. men and warriors. Mm -hmm. So he's loyal to Tarzan by at, by at the end because Tarzan has earned his respect. So uh, you know, another great character arc. Yes, yeah, and uh, as you were saying, uh, I think it shows. Burroughs presence of mind when he does and, and a lot of writers I think would too but remembering that they don't have that same level of comprehension because a lot of us forget it every day mm -hmm. with our pets I sit there going like and my dog's my dog's a good dog it's, it's an Aussie retriever so it's ab actually smarter than me but <laughs> <laughs> getting it getting it to obey me is can sometimes be pretty tough 
And then I go and see that uh, Tarzan, okay, make-believe character. Now someone's going to get mad I said that. Can't uh, uh, always communicate and comprehend with, uh, get the animals to comprehend what he's doing. I'm sort of like, well, Tarzan can't do it. I shouldn't feel so bad. <laughs> yeah, we see that a few chapters from now where Tarzan's tied up and there's no way he can tell the, the ape or the leopard who's found him to, to just chew through his ropes. You know, yeah, that's a great a concept scene too. Give it. Yeah. So uh, there's no way he can get that concept across to just an animal. Um, so he, lo he loves these animals and respects them, but there are still animals. So there's some limitations yeah. to what they can do and not do. Anything else, Jess, or? No, I'm quiet. Okay. Um, so they, they go, it takes about 10 hours to get across the water, which when they didn't know how far they were, obviously the chief with some of his tribe members, warriors, got out there so they knew the land was within reach but normally when you're on because of curvature earth if you're on the water or if you're on the great plains or some desert uh, you can see about 30 to 36 miles so on this island depending on what kind of hill or mountainous area they had and um, the, uh, chances are really good it's quite a bit over 30 40 miles for the 10 hours, but you can make that in 10 hours in a boat too, rowing. Um, uh, they wouldn't be able to see it from their beach. So it's because uh, sometimes people think, oh, they did in a couple hours, they should have been able to see jungle. It doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> so uh, uh, they do make it to the beach there and that's where um, uh, they kind of finagle around a bit there and, and, uh, um, and uh, of course, uh, there's a time where uh, two of the Mangani there, two of the apes uh, do wander off, but uh, uh, Tarzan goes along with Sheeta and they go inland to check the area out, do a little hunting, and um, uh, also to, they circle around and come out because they're looking for the river that they want to go upstream on that uh, the chief said that he and his warriors had came out of. And they find it. And when they follow the river back to the ocean, um, they're only about a mile from where they landed with the canoe. So they get everybody back together and they get in canoe to take it to go upstream because uh, if people haven't heard the first part or read the first part of the book, the, he, Tarzan is looking for his kidnapped Jane and their son Jack. Um, and they're that's Tarzan, man. He wants his family back. <laughs> and of course, the chief wants uh, to go back uh, to his village, too. Um, when they do start going upstream from the ocean, a, uh, another uh, native uh, from an, another tribe sees them, and he goes inland, goes to uh, uh, his village to let them know he's watching these strangers. And part of it is because um, uh, earlier, uh, uh, some other white men had come through, which uh, would be part of those who had kidnapped uh, yeah, uh, Jane and, and Jack, but they also had uh, killed people and stolen from the village. These are, you know, they're bad guys. And uh, so he's letting them know and they're kind of preparing that uh, um, Tarzan, actually he's only one white man, but then with uh, um, the other chief and, <laughs> and like, what, well, what, what's he doing getting, <laughs> what are those apes doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> paddling the boat so they're, they're pretty weird and uh warns them that they're coming up and then um uh they do uh they do uh meet and come across each other um and actually i jumped a gun they the other warrior didn't quite catch that it was apes in it till they basically come head to head around the corner on the river and the warriors from the other tribe are like wait a minute there's a whole bunch of apes in that thing. <laughs> they get all scared. Yeah. Anyway, Tarzan does end up uh, talking to the chief of uh, of, uh, of, yeah. of the yeah. village, of, of the other people there, and talks to him. And uh, he tells him about a story that uh, several months before, well, no, three, but I guess less than a week, three. Three moons or whatever would be like uh, three yeah, days. Three, moon, three moons would actually be three months. He was actually, remember, Tarzan was actually stuck on that island for a little while. Okay, okay. So it's been, it's been three months. Okay, because as I was thinking that first three months, I'm like, well, maybe three nights, but yeah, you're right on that. Mm -hmm. um, 
and God, okay, just because I know there's a part where uh, um, they mentioned where Jane does see Tarzan at another time, but not just, uh, and that's with a, a different timeline. So my brain just got a little scrambled there. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. But uh, so they talk about it, and then um, and uh, Tarzan's quite certain that the leader of the people who've done this is uh, Rockoff, who mm -hmm. has been more than a thorn in his side, Tarzan's side, through um, a number of years and a number of uh, the adventures in the books at this stage in uh, the series. Uh, at that point, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I told you I lost my notes, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, Tar uh, I'm good. Yeah. Basically, yeah, Tarzan, yeah, Tarzan like finds out that Rokoff has been by, but that they were chasing a man, woman, and baby with some porters who were ahead of them. Yeah. So, um, so uh, uh, the chapter ends with them pursuing those, all of that. And what we have here, I think, is a really interesting example, an effective example of what's called interlacing. Um, we're gonna, he's going to flash back uh, Burroughs in later chapters. So we're going to find out that the Swede helped Jane escape with the baby and they're ahead of Rokoff and Rokoff is pursuing them. But Tarzan doesn't have that information. He just knows that what is, who is presumably Jane and his son and somebody else are running from Rokoff and Rokoff is pursuing them. And he doesn't know how that ended up and we don't know either. Um, yeah. So it, it's a good way of creating suspense and uh, just an interesting way of telling the story. Um, it's, you know, interlacing. He, the chronology as a whole is going to make perfect sense once we have all the information, but we've got to wait for Burroughs to flash back in the other chapters so that we can find out how this situation arose exactly. Yeah, and then uh, um, the, the, the other chief uh, is, here is uh, Kaveri, and uh, he's going to help Tarzan get some, loan Tarzan some of his warriors, but they go to the village and no one's there. So mm -hmm. They doing that, and uh, uh, that that would be the end of that chapter, and would bring yeah. us to chapter seven, which is called "Betrayed." Any mm -hmm. other comments before we go on? Well, I want to I want to mention that Kaveri, the, the the head of that village, they plan to attack Tarzan and his party because they were attacked by Rokoff, the other white guy yeah. that came through, attacked them. So they were wrong to attack Tarzan, but from their point of view, they had they had reason to be worried. Um, so it was an understandable motivation from their point of view. Didn't work out well for them. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, the apes and the element of surprise meant they lost that fight pretty quick. But um, I kind of like that they're just not attacking just for the sake of attacking. They're not just stereotype yeah. warrior, you know, African savages. They actually have an understandable motivation for presuming Tarzan is, is a danger to them and attacking them. And, and, and they do work it out. Kaveri now realizes Tarzan's a man of honor and he's mm -hmm. willing to help him out. And, and when they come into the next chapter, they have gone out and searched for, for the uh, tribes people and uh, more or less uh, kind of round them up <laughs> and uh, get them back into the village there where the chief picks out uh, a dozen warriors to accompany and uh, go with Tarzan as they continue their search. Um, so as a, uh, uh, he's, uh, they're also looking for any other natives or any other news uh, mm -hmm. that they can find, find out about which way they may have gone and where they're doing and exactly who it is. He, he also uh, um, steps off and as he stars in and is wont to do, sometimes he feels he can make better speed and, and uh, find out stuff quicker than having a group of people or animals around them. And he also goes on in search of that as they're going up river in different villages I step off to look at. And uh, some, no one's there going by the idea that they've either been killed, captured or, or ran away because of, of the uh, evil henchmen coming through. Or uh, he, then he does find one where he's able to talk to him and, uh, get the information and at this point uh, 
this is what you were alerting, uh, alluding to earlier, I believe, Tim, um, who he believes Rokoff, it sounds like Rokoff was there only three days, about three days before. But he, in turn, at, is going up trying to find the other group that came through, which uh, theoretically, as far as we know, would be a group of which, uh, with the Swede, with uh, uh, Jane and, and Jack and whoever else is in that group with the pen out. So Rokoff's trying to, that's his moneymaker there. He, he wants them back, first off, to torture Tarzan with, and second off, not if he can get some money, great, but he's, he's really looking more than anything for revenge to for Tarzan. The, uh, the bloodlust in this guy in Rokoff is... Um, yeah, I, I agree. Rokoff is definitely greedy, but at this point, he would give up making money uh, to be able to uh, mess with, tar to torture Tarzan in any way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, so um, uh, he ends up leaving. He does some traveling through the trees, not swinging on vines, but sliding on limbs or running through <laughs> <laughs> the network as he uh, did, which is one thing I did really appreciate in Legend of Tarzan, uh, the movie, last movie. Um, how they had him jumping and running and somersaulting, gymnastics, the whole thing like that. Not mm -hmm. just the uh, version we're so used to growing up with and not to make stabs at that, but uh, much more accurate here where uh, uh, he uses them like little pathways and stuff to, to get through there. Because I always kind of figured, even when I was a kid, if he's swinging on those vines for the distance, what is it actually hooked to on top? And how does he know where he's going? <laughs> uh, 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 so he does that. And then he ends up at a village there, um, which is a village of uh, cannibals. But they... Uh, yeah, they're working for... They're work. not antagonistic. They're not sitting around with forks and knives saying, oh, come on in, friend. <laughs> But as, as would be, uh, he does uh, stay the uh, night with them there and seems to get along with them, bit and talks um, to him, and he spends the night there. Meantime, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, a couple of the warriors from the cannibal tribe go out and come back with Rokoff and his men. And, uh, um, or... Yeah. yeah, however, they get a hold of Rokov. Anyway, Rokov is, has told them that someone like Tarzan, he wants captured, and they uh, will give a war to give the, actually give the chief a gun, a rifle. So he's, which is big medicine mm -hmm. for him. And um, uh, Tarzan's sleeping, and they uh, tie him up, and um, uh, now they're going to, you know, get pretty rough. He's tied up, and and uh, Rokoff kicks him in the face. And according to what I grabbed uh, uh, to refresh my mind a bit earlier today, reading through, I have the uh, Ballantine book uh, from the, uh, what year? Uh, Ballantine was probably early 72s, uh, mm -hmm. before the Neil Adams with, uh, you're talking about the guy's art earlier. I can't remember. Come on, I know the, I know the painter's uh, artist's name for the cover. Anyway, he's writing a crocodile on that. That'll be coming out pretty soon. Um, and <laughs> they're at this scene where he's uh, uh, kicking Tarzan in the face, and the book actually says Trazon instead of Tarzan. Found a typo. Mm -hmm. Fifty years later, <laughs> but uh, uh, so he's very cruel about that, and uh, he. Um, wants Tarzan to be tortured by the fact that he'll be tied up. He's going to become a meal. And while all this is happening, he'll wait till just the right moment to let Tarzan in on what he did to the wife, his kids, but he's going to be lying about that. Mm -hmm. That brings us uh, to the end of chapter seven. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we should note that the chief takes the bribe of a rifle to capture Tarzan. They have like a dozen guys jump him while he's sleeping to capture him. So, yeah, yeah. so that, that's why it's believable that Tarzan, of all people, could be taken prisoner. 
because um, uh, even Tarzan can't take a dozen guys at once, and they got him while he was tired and asleep. So, um, and then the confrontation with Rokoff is just really tense um, and really effective. Rokoff is uh, just the villain you love to hate. He's a really effective villain. And it, it very much so, yeah. And, and so uh, the uh, last chapter I'll be talking about for this segment here, chapter eight, The Dance of Death, uh, where he has been securely bound and, and he's being kept back in a hut and uh, um, uh, they're going to take him out for the ceremony later on and, and have their way as it be with them and salt and pepper and stuff. <laughs> and while he's there, he, he the Tarzan scent, jungle scent comes alive for him and he recognizes uh, the smell of uh, Shita uh, prowling behind. And uh, Shita tears her way through through the hut, through the, uh, you know, bamboo wood, grass, whatever material they may be using there. Um, and comes in where Tarzan is and he's bound, but at that point, uh, you know, he also can't really tell her, you know, chew through uh, the ropes. So he's there. In the meantime, one of the warriors comes in, checking on him, and uh, Shita kills the warrior inside the hut. Well, everyone outside thinks they're having a good time till they hear those blood curdling scream and noises and roars and all that. Now they're a little scared. <laughs> And then, uh, uh, meantime, Shita decides to go back outside a hut. So when some of them finally uh, takes them, uh, uh, that, in fact, they're not even going in yet. Yeah. They are uh, screaming and running around and stuff. And finally, a couple of uh, uh, Rokov's men um, show up. And it's been like one or two hours at this point. Uh, come in and go into the... Uh, Hut and there's Tarzan by himself and, and the uh, warrior uh, torn, dead, bloodied. Uh, and the warriors poke some of them, poke their heads in. Look, now they're really spooked because did Tarzan do this or did a spirit do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is Tarzan protected by the spirit? And uh, um, and uh, so that's. Uh, they're like uh, the chief and the people are like, we need to, we, we got to get rid of this guy. We need to kill him now, put him on a stake and they do. And uh, so uh, they put him out on a stake to prepare for him. And, and uh, Rokoff at that time grabs a lance, a uh, spear and, uh, you know, gives a little jab to Tarzan there, draws a little blood into his side. And Tarzan just kind of, I can, I'm, I, you know, I can see it in my head where, where he is uh, uh, like this, uh, I won't say arrogant. I smile like contempt for him. Like, yeah, tie me up, do that. You got to poke me with the spear. That's the best you can, you little man. Which <laughs> really ticks Rokoff off. Um, and yeah, this is that, you know, he's made sure Tarzan can't get away on the ropes and stuff. So yeah, he's a uh, chicken um, poop <laughs> guy. Uh, be nice there. And uh, so now he's there and the uh, natives go into like a starting to shout and it turns into more like the ceremonial dancing, uh, going back around to that. And then uh, meantime, Rokov's shouting at Tarzan over and uh, telling him like that. Yes, uh, Jane is uh, uh, here in Africa and, and uh, she wants to wants to have that pleasure of telling him, a, telling what would be a false story so that the worst possible images would be in Tarzan's mind when he dies um, uh, of what has happened to his wife and to his son, the two things at now that he truly does love most in this world. But the noise is so loud and, and the bloodlust is running up in the uh, warriors here because now they're dancing around. All of them are starting to poke at him with spears or knives and, and draw blood in that way and this way. That it's got to tick off Rokoff because he doesn't get that cruel, cruel fulfillment of saying what he wants to say to Tarzan and, and have him die his way. Um, and then uh, suddenly Shita 
has come back through the hut and come out front door and jumps up to stand next to Tarzan as a fellow warrior, as a fellow companion, as a fellow member of the pack. Well, <laughs> it doesn't matter how many warriors are there with their spears. <laughs> they got this giant leopard that jumped right through them and turned on them and is getting ready to kill some of them. They're gone. They're gone. <laughs> they're, they're ready to take off. Or, well, they're saying they're frozen, paralyzed, but you know, like that. And uh, it ends with, uh, as they're standing there and the cheetah's getting ready, maybe do some killing and Tarzan's tied to a stake, bleeding. He looks up and sees something coming from behind them through the hut. And that's the end of the chapter. Let me say, because I, I won't have any more comments on the chapter here. The power of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm-hmm. Now, I've, I've read this book a couple times. Uh, last time I read it was about 20 years ago. And I think I was in a hurry to read it because I bought some new volumes. And I started reading the series from book one again. So uh, the paperback, and I think it's still Valentine only in the rights at that time. Um, there were two uh, books to a paperback. Tarzan, Return of Tarzan. Second one is Beast of Tarzan, Son of Tarzan. And I kind of wanted to get through, I want to read them in order. I'm not OCD, but I want to read them. <laughs> I want to get through it because I want to get to another of my favorites, the Son of Tarzan. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but going through it again after this time and going here, the power of this book, the twists and turns, the full on interaction of rivalry and, and, companionship and helping and killing between man and animals um, and the mystery that he entails in here is it very very well done and I pretty much know what's happening what's going up <laughs> uh, um, when I was reading through the book again here and of course paying special attention to the chapters we knew we were going to be talking about um, I I I finished a chapter and I didn't put the book down. I skipped ahead another chapter to get back to the next scene with Tarzan. <laughs> so you skipped over the flashback with Jane to get back to this scene. Yeah, to fully, <laughs> to fully <laughs> finish out that scene because I didn't want to spend, you know, 10 mm-hmm. pages of a, the next chapter mm-hmm. waiting for what I knew I was going to enjoy. <laughs> so, uh, to me, that's good writing. That is. That's, that's good um, storytelling. It, it is a great place for a cliffhanger, though, and this is common. This is a common thing that um, Burroughs did in his books that were not written in the first person was to end a chapter with a cliffhanger, then switch to another character for at least a chapter, so that you have that cliffhanger tension out there for a while. And it's it's a trick he used a lot, and he always used it very effectively. And I think it's particularly effective too, because I here because I I agree it's a powerful scene and the imagery is powerful. Um, and the, it's just, it's got a dark humor to it. When Cheetah kills the native in the hut and then leaves and they see the mangled body there with Tarzan bound before him and have no idea how this guy died. Um, yeah. there's, there's a really nice dark humor to it. Um, and, and, and it's a signature of the pulps and the, mm-hmm. you know, Saturday cereals and stuff too. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, a lot of his stories, there were a number of pulps times where the whole thing was printed in just one issue. Mm-hmm. But when they were spread out from one issue to another in chapters, whether for him or Muncie or, or yeah. Earls or, or uh, you know, a number of, of the Merritt, I love uh, Abraham Merritt, any of those writers, they had, they knew it was going to be another month or whenever the next issue was going to come out. Yeah. And they both wanted to keep on selling stories to magazine and they wanted readers to be hung there going like, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait, <laughs> where they'd be telling magazine, tell us what's going to happen in this story. You know? <laughs> so they were masters at having these cliffhangers like this. And that also gave them luxury. So when the next issue came out, since there'd been some time and the anticipation I may have died down a little, that they could start with a, another pocket, another chapter, mm-hmm. another branch character of the story and do that before coming and, and uh, answering that cliffhanger. And yeah. it's, uh, good. it's good stuff. Yeah, it is. Now, something I thought of just now, I wish I'd thought of, uh, um, is that Tarzan uh, 
being poked by Rokoff, but just not reacting in fear or pain or anything, just giving that smile of contempt. Uh, that actually has a, there's a literary ancestor to that, just the 1841 novel Deerslayer. The, the, the oh. title character, Deerslayer, Natty Bumpo, is at one point a prisoner of Indians tied to a stake, and they are throwing tomahawks at him to see who can get closest without hitting him. And he's just he's just making fun of them the whole time. Um, so he, if that same like taunting your enemy, you know, Natty was doing it verbally, where Tarzan is just doing it with this smile of contempt. But it's the same idea. They're trying to torture you and get to you, but you're just taunting them back and not showing any fear at all. So there's a yeah. literary antecedent to that scene. Um, I think and, uh, we may have seen other heroes do, do that too. Zero mm -hmm. comes to mind, particularly now, mm -hmm. the guy Williams episodes where he would have a slight smile upon his face while he was dealing with, with an opponent. And the impression, at least for the viewer, was that Zorro uh, had things well in hand. He was just uh, toying with his opponent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually yesterday just watched an episode of How the West Was Won, which was a James Arness series from the late 70s. Okay, yeah. And the, the, the char a character played by Jack Elam was tied to the stake by Indians. They were doing the tomahawk thing. I think they, they were, took it directly from Deerslayer. But it was the same thing. He was just taunting them. Um, well, they when they were trying to scare to to make him break by by the, with the tomahawk throws. So uh, Tarzan's in good company with, in this scene. Yeah. So, so chapter nine, uh, he does switch point of view. He goes back in time as well. So this is where the interlacing begins to come together. He's going back to explain exactly how. Jane and the baby and, and uh, Sven, the Swede, ended up uh, escaping from Rokoff and being in front of them while fleeing through the jungle. So it returns to when Jane was still a prisoner on the ship Kincaid uh, while it's proceeding on its way. But by this time, Sven, um, it, you know, he, he, she, remember, she's been being kind to him in whatever way possible. And he turns out to be kind of a good hearted guy. You know, just about the whole crew of the King Kincaid is made up of crooks and rogues. Um, and Sh I have a feeling that Shen probably did some stuff he shouldn't have done in the past. But um, when he when he overhears Rokoff actually trying to propose marriage to Jane, which happened in a previous chapter, and um, he hears the plans for the baby to be turned over to cannibals, that's too much for Shen. So... Um, um, yeah, where one, Rokoff actually tells Jane in French that they're going to kill the baby. Um, and that's too, that's what's too much for Shen. Um, and he spoke French as well. Everybody thought he was dumb, but he's multilingual. So the next night, um, he gets her out, gets the baby as well. And they climb over the side of the boat, get, ship, get into a boat and make it ashore into the same river that Tarzan will be coming down a, a couple of months later. Um, so after a few hours, they get to a village. Um, the child's asleep. Jane doesn't want to disturb him. But a little later, you know, while the, uh, in the daylight, the baby stirs. Jane looks at it, and she's just completely shocked about something. We're not told what it is yet. And then she faints to the ground. Um, it's another wonderful cliffhanger. It's not, she's not in immediate danger. But there was something about the baby. And we know that the baby's not dead because it was moving. So if you haven't read this story yet, what is it about seeing the baby, or presumably her son, that makes her faint? It's just a, another wonderful cliffhanger. It's like one great cliffhanger after another. Um, and that was chapter nine. Any comments from you guys about that? No, I think that is a good, what you said there, just that fact she uh, sees the baby and, and faints is a... Um, is, yeah, it's going a great way that uh, Burroughs is playing his cards. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's just another wonderful chapter. I also love the captain, the, the character of Shven. Um, he is one of my favorite one shot characters in the Tarzan series, just because of his honor and his courage. And as we'll see soon, the way he's willing to sacrifice himself to keep Jane and the baby uh, safe. Um, he's a real sweetheart. He's a, yeah, a real sweetheart, big, tough guy. Apparently, we think he's dumb. Burroughs wrote him in such a way that we as readers think he's just a dumb thug, too, at first. But when he turns out to be smarter than we think and also a decent human being willing to put himself at risk to save Jane and the baby, 
that's just he's just awesome yeah um and chapter 10 is actually named after them the swede um this is going to jump ahead in time again so um so we've gone a flashback a couple of months to jane escaping and while that was happening tarzan would have still been stuck on that island um but now we're jumping ahead a few months to back to tarzan being a uh, uh tied to the stake uh flanked by cheetah with the uh, both Rokoff's party and the natives uh, momentarily stunned by terror. And what Tarzan saw coming out of his hut was the apes of, of Akut. They've come back to rescue him. Um, and the blacks, the, the, the natives regroup. Uh, Tarzan's freed by Mugambi just as they attack again. There is a battle. Um, several apes are killed. So uh, we're down to Akut and five other apes after the battle is done. But um, uh, the, they, they do chase them off. Um, and they find out that Rokoff and his men escape by canoe. So they start pursuing him. Uh, and days go by as they're chasing Rokoff far, farther and farther upriver. Um, and they're, they're seeking both him and they're seeking for uh, the white man, the white woman, and the baby who are in front of them. They just don't know what's going on with that. Remember, Tarzan assumes the baby is his son. But as far as he knows, Jane is still back in London. So he doesn't know who the guy and the girl are. Um, he's, he, keep, he tends to travel in advance of Mugambi and the animals. So because he can in getting information from villagers. Um, and then he comes across a dying white man. And this is Shven. Um, and uh, um, Tarzan actually has to fight a warrior who was about to uh, kill Shven. Um, he re Sven sees this, he recognizes Tarzan, um, and the Swede has an arrow through his lung. Uh, Tarzan at first assumes he's a bad guy, that he's part of Rowcroft's crew, which, you know, he was, but um, uh, uh, Sven explains what's going on, and um, Tarzan, I love it, Tarzan immediately expresses regret for threatening Sven. He realizes this guy had been protecting his wife in fact, had, um, had um, uh, effectively given his life, protecting uh, his wife and baby. Um, Sven realizes he's dying. He asks Tarzan to kill him, but Tarzan can't do that. And that's another impressive thing, I think. Tarzan's pretty casual about killing people if he has to, but um, he doesn't want to kill this guy. His whole attitude towards the man has changed. And he just holds Sven for a while until the man finally dies. And that is the end of chapter 10. Um, by the way, I want to go just take a moment. I forgot to do this at the beginning of the episode. I want to credit the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs chapter summary project found at erblist.com, which I, I think we all refer to constantly. We always read the book again before we do these episodes and make our own notes. But when we are giving these summaries, um, we are using we, these chapter summaries. We're using that online uh, chapter summary from from the that summary project as uh, to uh, make sure that we cover everything. And so I want to just as I we have in previous episodes, I want to express our appreciation for the scholarship that went into that summary project and how useful it is for us. So do you guys have any comments on chapter 10? Well, I'd like to step back for just a moment. Uh, comment I was going to make there with the previous chapter, and that is uh, even though this uh, baby that Jane and, and the the Swede have is not Jane's, she still does what she can, and, and the Swede does too. They do what mm -hmm. they can to uh, care for the child. Mm -hmm. They don't abandon it. They don't just cast it aside because it's not hers. Uh, Jane still gives it the, the the loving care that she would give her own child if it were there. Mm -hmm. So I just want to point that out. Yeah, I, I think we'll get confirmation of that in an upcoming chapter. Um, and that's that's typical of Jane, of course. She, oh, yeah. She's yeah. ultimately a compassionate human being. and She's not going to refuse to help anybody in need, especially a, a helpless baby. Uh, that's what the hero does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we get a chance, um, just several ways Jane is proactive in this one. It's not just, um, she is going to get to plug a few bad guys with a rifle towards the end of the novel. So, but she doesn't do a lot of fighting, but she conducts herself with courage and with compassion the whole time. Uh, she never loses her head. Um, and she, um, um, uh, you know, and then her caring for the baby, even though 
the you know the baby is not hers is just uh, typical of her and of her courage and of her uh, just sense of morality. So Scott, any comments on chapter ten? Um, I think it's a pretty clear cut chapter. I think yeah, I think you covered it really well, and I like your uh, thoughts uh, about the Swede. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's just he's one of my favorite literary characters of all time. It's as small as his part is, it has a lot of impact. Um, so the next chapter stays with Tarzan. Uh, we are going to get a flashback soon to find out exactly how Sven came to his end. But for this chapter, we still stay with Tarzan. He buries Sven, he resumes his search, um, but there are so many uh, native and animal trails overlaying each other that it baffles even his sense of smell. Um, so he, he, he marks his own trail for uh, his, his allies following him. Um, but he realized that he himself, after um, there's a week of rain while he's still on the trail, it obliterates all the tracks and he's lost. He has absolutely no idea where to go. Um, so he knows that Sven was going to try and reach German East Africa, which is a huge amount of distance away. So now he's thinking maybe Rokoff will try the same thing. So he heads in that direction. Um, and he, he eventually does find villagers who have met Rokoff. And uh, they find he is heading for the East Coast. He has, he's gonna actually try to, to cross Africa and end up on the other side. Um, we also learn that Rokoff is going a bit nuts here. He's hanged several of his porters. Um, the, the rest of his porters are getting ready to desert. Um, the, the native that Tarzan is questioning when he, when he learns all this doesn't know about a white woman, um, but Tar or he says he doesn't. Tarzan senses that he's lying. So he, had, he just talks them into giving him a meal and to staying overnight in that village. Um, he's offered the chief's, the chief's hut, but that would mean that the, all, the uh, oldest wife of the chief would be evicted. And he doesn't want to do that. So he stays in a hut occupied by other young men. Um, the chief, though, is thinking of a reward that Rokoff offered if Tarzan is killed. So um, he just has his warriors try to sneak up on Tarzan uh, during the night. But Tarzan senses this movement. Um, and the old wife, the chief's old wife, whom Tarzan had refused to kick out of her hut, he warns Tarzan about the upcoming treasury, treachery and also tells him that Rokoff is nearby. So she offers to lead Tarzan to Rokoff. So they get out of the village, um, but they don't realize that the chief's son has overheard this. Um, so they send runners off in different directions to, to, uh, to see how they can deal with Tarzan. Um, and the chapter ends with just a high impact bit of emotion. He asked the old woman, well, what about the white woman and the baby? And she says, yeah, there was a woman there and a little baby as well, but the baby died of fever. So that right there, that makes Tarzan think that his son is dead. And I think it's important to note that the last time we saw Jane is when she fainted after seeing the baby. We have not ourselves learned yet that the baby is not Jack. So as far as we as the reader know at this point, Jack has just died of a fever. Um, so it's got emotional impact, not just for Tarzan himself, but also for those, uh, also for those of us reading the story for the first time. Because um, we won't know until the next chapter that the baby is not Jack. So that's chapter 11. Any, any comments from you guys? God, no, I think you got it right down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nothing for me. Okay. Well, chapter 12, we're going to conclude tonight's episode with the discussion of chapter 12. That jumps back again. So we're jumping it back in time several months to uh, when Jane and Sven first escaped, got to a village, and she looks at the baby for the first time. She fainted because the baby's not hers. Um, at first, she thinks maybe Sven has played a trick on her. But Sven says that that's the only baby that was on board and that Rokoff believes that the child's her. So at some point, babies got switched, but nobody was aware of this until this moment. And for the rest of the novel, 
we're going to have no idea what happened to Jack. Uh, Sven and uh, Jane and some um, porters continue to push onward. Uh, Sven is actually hoping to cross most of the continent and get to the German colony on the other side. Um, he, he buys a canoe, um, he makes it farther up river, uh, but um, the baby catches a fever. Uh, Jane is caring for the baby as best she can. Uh, it's not her baby, but as you mentioned, Jess, she's not going to abandon a child or refuse to care for a child. Uh, they find out that Rokoff is coming near them. Um, and Sven realizes that especially with the sick baby, they're not gonna get away. And he does just this incredibly brave thing. He uh, hides Jane and later on suggests that she try to get a canoe and get back to the sea. And um, he says, well, I'm gonna go talk to Rokoff. But Jane knows, uh, and, he's, and he's gonna claim that Jane and the baby are dead. But Jane knows that this isn't gonna work. Jane knows that Sven is going to do something suicidal in order to keep Jane safe, that he's consciously giving his life to save them. Um, and she doesn't want this to happen, uh, but there's nothing she can do about it. And the child's health is getting worse. So because she needs help for the child, she gets up and she runs down a trail to try and find a village and ho hopefully get some sort of help for the fever. She hears gunfire in the background. So she knows that Anderson, Sven Anderson has found Rokoff. She stumbles into a village. Um, she wants help from the natives. Um, and this is the village that uh, Tarzan finds in the, uh, later on in that was, as we, as was account, recounted in the previous chapter. Uh, so all this interlacing is coming together. The, the, time, the uh, time periods are about to converge. Um, and uh, the, 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 uh, the chief of this village questions Jane. Um, and she tells him that Tarzan, he tells her that Tarzan is dead. She's stunned. And then at the same time, she takes another hit when she looks at the baby and realizes the baby has died of fever. And then she looks up to see Rokoff there looking down at her. So the one thing after another, she's told Tarzan is dead, doesn't have any way of knowing that's not true. The baby she's caring for has died and she has come to love this little baby, even though it's not hers. Uh, Sven had, uh, was almost certainly dead. Um, is sacrificing himself to try and save her. And then Rokoff has caught her anyway. So bang, 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 bang. And um, um, that ends chapter 12 and our discussion of the novel for this episode. Um, any comments on this chapter from you guys? Um, uh, just, uh, um, I consider it kind of a, a fairly emotional uh, chapter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with everything that's going on there. It's not, it's not uh, chasing up and down the river and, and uh, fighting. It's, uh, 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 this is more of a, a psychological or, or a emotional reveal, I think, on, on this part. Yeah, I agree. It is, it is um, just a very emotional chapter. The death of the unnamed baby is just heartbreaking. Um, it's, it's not looking good for the home team. I can say that. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and uh, um, um, it is just another great um, cliffhanger. Uh, it just uh, it, it would be interesting to see a list going through the Tarzan books of the different forms cliffhangers took at the end of chapters during his writing career. Um, just uh, you know, a character in danger, or a character hit with bad news, or um, you know, the bad guy showing up again or what have you. Character has amnesia. Character has amnesia. Yeah, that, that happens a couple of times, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, um, it, would, it would be interesting. I'm not it, just just for fun to see a list of the different sorts of, of uh, cliffhangers. Uh, but this has to be one of the most emotional cliffhangers because it's not just one thing. It's like three or four things. Um, you know, uh, tragic news, loss of her only ally, loss of the baby, and here's the bad guy again. Um, so she's not in immediate physical danger of being killed, which is often how the, the, the nature of the cliffhanger, but um, I think she'd probably rather be in physical danger at this point than dealing with everything else that's going on. So 
I, I, I wanted to comment on the interlacing thing. First of all, I think your description and, and the comments about that were right on target. I was just reflecting on my own experience. Back when I first read this book, mm -hmm. which I would imagine was around 1968, 1969, long enough, uh, I would be, uh, gee whiz, let me give up my age. I would be uh, probably 13, give or take 14, maybe. Um, the interlacing thing didn't bother me as a reader then. Mm -hmm. I was a pretty avid reader, and uh, it certainly, I really don't think too much of it now. So long as I know where I am in the timeline of the story and mm -hmm. who I'm dealing with, I'm generally pretty good. Burroughs does a good point of explaining that very easily. Yeah, I think he does it well because we never lose track of where we are or when we are in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, it's just part of his skill as a story, storyteller. For plotting out the plotting out the action in a way so that we as readers always know what's going on. Right. Um, uh, another writer, and I will be ironic here because I know that J.R. Tolkien was not a big fan of the Tarzan series, um, but he was a great writer in his own right. And he he does that in Lord of the Rings. He'll have a chapter following one character uh, uh, through a certain amount of time, and then he'll jump back to other characters and what's what they're doing during that time. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. And in the end, we always understand what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, um, uh, yeah, it's always, uh, it's, oh, it's, I wish Tolkien had been a Tarzan fan. I don't know why he wasn't, um, but, but he was an excellent writer in its own part. Oh, and they both used the concept of interlacing very effectively in their fiction. So, mm -hmm. so I think, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. I think. J.R.R. Tolkien had very specific ideas of how legends and myths should be dealt with and probably always kind of disapproved a little bit of any author who didn't do it the way he thought was right. That makes him sound very unreasonable. He wasn't. He was a brilliant man. But um, I, I just think there were some writers he would probably never appreciate because they didn't handle legendary characters in exactly the way he thought they would. That's just an opinion. Once again, I can't. Point Considering what a scholar he was too, like in yeah. front of C.S. Lewis, that makes sense. Yeah, he was very big on, you know, he was, he was a brilliant man and he knew the old myths uh, by heart, often in their original languages. So um, he, he, he thought of myths and fairy tales and stories like that as having a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. um, then again, he might just not have liked Burroughs' style on personal grounds, which is, you know, perfectly reasonable. Um, so I'm talking more, I'm giving more of an opinion about Tolkien than I, than I should, because I'm not an expert on him enough to know. So, but um, just wondering why he didn't like Tarzan that much. So, because I think, I just know of a quote where he said he, he didn't care for the Tarzan books, but he didn't give any details. So I'm just kind of spitballing on why that might've been. Maybe he thought he was too precious. Um, <laughs> so, um, maybe, uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Tolkien. I like Lewis. I like yeah. Burroughs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like them all. I know. It would, but it, Burroughs, I love Burroughs. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So any thoughts at all about the first 12 chapters of this before we, uh, bring this part to the, to an end? Well, I, I want to say I, I've, I've enjoyed tonight's, uh, discussion. I've enjoyed our prior discussion in fact i listened to part one of this a couple of times which i don't normally do mm -hmm. and i don't want anybody to think i'm in love with my, the sound of my own voice i'm not uh, <laughs> but our discussion was really a lot of fun and, and the, tonight's discussion has been very in-depth and thoughtful yeah. and, and and uh we've got i think we've got a good story here to work with that's, that certainly helps they're all good stories mm -hmm. of course but this one's really good mm -hmm. and um i've just i've enjoyed our discussion tonight that's all i'm saying well, i appreciate that thank you yeah. Um, I had a thought uh, uh, this last week or two after the first segment and going and knowing it's going to be two segments and then knowing it's going to be three segments. You know, it's not it's 150 pages in a in a traditional paperback book. It's mm -hmm. it's not a large book. It's a pulp story. Uh, but we're going to have three different episodes covering this book. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in this. It's a fast moving book. There's a lot of stuff happening in it. Uh, I, I never would have picked this as being the a book that would have been, you know, uh, three, four, five hours of discussion length over the course of a 
three episodes. Not that mm-hmm. there's anything wrong with that, but, but uh, I could see maybe sometime I'm sure would do Jungle Tales of Tarzan mm-hmm. where they're each different segments, different yeah. ages and groups, and each story has its own its own little uh, universe or world at that time where you might have different discussions, but it, uh, it, it's given me some time of thinking here about this. I'm just, I'm like, you know, you don't have to have a 500 page book to yeah. put in a lot of stuff in there that makes you think about things mm-hmm. and, and appreciate the storytelling process. Yeah, a, a lot of modern novels, there are novels that should be 500 pages that are legitimately that long, yeah. but a, a lot of modern novels I think are padded out for publisher requirements to be longer. And it's too bad because Burroughs is a prime example of someone who could write a reasonably uh, long, uh, you know, a, a, a novel of a reasonable length, like, you know, 150 to 200 pages and tell the story well within that time frame. And there's no padding and nothing unnecessary. It's just cool stuff from start to finish. I think the phrase is economy of words, and that is yeah. getting the most yeah. bang for your buck from as few words as possible. Mm-hmm. Something that I sure as heck don't do because it takes me 500 words to say good morning. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, but Burroughs uh, obviously and, and, and does that with his, I would say in general with all his books, mm-hmm. and the fact that we're spending so much time discussing it, and it is what the 150 pages of whatever we established. Uh, which is short compared to some other books. Uh, there's a lot in this, as we've said, I, and I think it yeah. bears out by the and, and it's good stuff. So, so the amount of time we're spending with it, and 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 the in-depth discussions we are having is thought-provoking, it's entertaining, and mm. it's exciting. Right? Yeah, it's and exciting. Uh, yeah, I think it was serendipity that we because we planned on we planned on two parter. It was serendipity, I think, that we had technical difficulties. We we're recording that first part and had to cut it short. Because we'd already gone like an hour and a half, and we were, I um, yeah, and I we probably would have had to have chopped it up into more than two parts anyway. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's it for now. So we will be back soon with the final part. I think what we hope is the final. We, part. What we hope is the final part. This may, <laughs> become, this may become the Beasts of Tarzan podcast because <laughs> we'll never run out of things to talk about. Uh, um, so uh, we will be back soon with part three, which at the moment we were planning on being the last part of the discussion of this novel. Um, we were thinking of doing, I think when we were trading messages on Facebook, we were thinking of doing I Am a Barbarian after that, right? Um, yes, just to let people a, know that would be fun. Are. That would be fun. It would be, I think, an unusual one to do, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, there's but, an announcement that was well, the announcement's already out, but there'll be mm-hmm. some news regarding Barbarian coming okay. out pretty soon. So um, cool. yes, that, that was the reason that topic came up. Okay. And then um, uh, that's it for tonight. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, you know, feel free to visit my blog at Comics Old Time Radio and other cool stuff. And you can find links to my books there. Um, you can buy lots of copies and make me wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. Um, and um, you guys want to like sign out? Well, my name is Jess Terrell, and you would know me once again from For the Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs on Facebook, where we talk uh, ERB, Edgar Rice Burroughs, his worlds, his characters, his uh, circ- his uh, events and books. We talk that pretty much 24-7. If you're looking for a good workout, come over sometime and help me pump that sunshine back here, way back here in the hills and <laughs> sticks, where, where <laughs> you can't get a load of sunshine unless you bring it in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, that for, I'm that far off the beaten path. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, I think it was uh, uh, Scott mentioned the Dum Dums coming up there in San Antonio, June, uh, what, two through four. By all means, make plans to attend that. It'll be a good time. And I, I thank you all for tonight's conversation. We we'll always have a great time. Mm-hmm. And this is Scott Stewart signing off. Thanks for listening. And again, what Jess said too. This is really, really enjoyed the discussion tonight on this book. It's a lot of fun. Want to emphasize again, please, people, sign up. Uh, it seems like we're not having as many problems with the travel and the pandemic and stuff anymore. So uh, go down to San Antonio and, and uh, uh, if you can and, and go to this convention. I'm, I'm really looking forward. I lived in San Antonio in the uh, early first half of the 80s and it's changed enormously, but it's fun to go back and visit some old haunts and see some friends. So. This has a double purpose for me. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah. I always like to remember the Alamo too. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, and the pandemic doesn't dare mess with Tarzan. That's <laughs> no, no. So, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, everybody, for listening, and we will be back with part three um, of our discussion of Beast of Tarzan soon.